Hello and welcome to Agree to Disagree, the series where I take some opinions from around the Fire Emblem community, pose them to my guest, and we discuss whether or not we agree with them and why. Before we start, I would like to thank the people who back the channel on Patreon and support me in making content like this and everything else on the channel. For more information on the benefits for backing from just £1 a month, check the link in the description. If you would like to see more content like this, consider subscribing to the channel, and if you wouldn't mind rating the video, it helps it to reach more people. If you have a take you would like to see appear in this series, you can either drop it in the comments or there is a channel for it in the Discord server which is linked in the description. If you're a content creator who is interested in participating in this series, feel free to get in touch via either Twitter or Discord. Finally, one last thing to note is that this was recorded a couple of months ago, so the opinions of both myself and my guest may have changed since this was recorded. Today I am joined by Akira Su. Hi, yeah, I'm Akira Su. Mostly I play GBAFE mods or ROM hacks, including LTCs thereof, and sometimes I make video essays too. So yeah, a link to Akira's channel will be down in the description, please go check it out, it's a lot of good stuff on there, and we're going to be talking through some Fire Emblem takes today. So, the first one we've got up for us is, turn count oriented play is a poor metric overall to determine performance. Hmm. That's an interesting one, because obviously I've got a lot of thoughts on that kind of one as someone who's, um, well, completed but is currently releasing videos of an LTC, mm -hmm. uh, Oops All Archers FE8, and is working on a second one of Sacred Echoes, the GBA make of Shadows of Lentia, which I know you're doing a playthrough of right now. Yep. I think it depends on to what extent you mean it, right? Because, like, obviously in a game without fixed level ups, obviously an LTC isn't necessarily going to be representative of general play, especially in the case of 100% growths, which is admittedly the form in which I do my LTCs, right? Yeah. But ultimately, I do think that something needs to be used to like judge performance within the Fire Emblem games, right? And turn counts a more objective lens through which to view a subjective topic. Yeah, I think there is definitely some merit to that. Like, I'm... I think there's a big difference between playing for turn count and playing for an LTC, right? Like, if oh, you're... Definitely. Playing for efficiency, wanting to keep your turn count low, like wanting to beat a map in as few turns as possible, is very different to something like an LTC, which is kind of a pre-planned run where you do a lot of RNG rigging for level ups, or like you said, use a 100% growth patch. And there's a lot of, like, say, rigging crits and things like that involved where you really try and get all of the luck to go in your favor. Whereas an efficiency playthrough is closer to standard play and you just try to keep your turn count low. Yeah, I would definitely say that efficient play tends to rely much more on, like, you know, actually likely things to happen. So you're not necessarily going to lose sleep over going for, I don't know, a 90 instead of a 95, but you're not going to be like, oh yes, this is a, a 19, because I'm rigging everything that's totally going to work. Yeah. So in terms of it being a metric to determine performance, I'm... Not too sure how I feel about it being like a poor metric. Like, it's a pretty. It's one that we've used for a long time within the community, of course. So, turn count's always kind of been that, that go to as, like, oh, we need something to separate these units, let's go for turn count. Because it's something that's consistent across whole playthroughs. Every playthrough has a turn count. So, mm -hmm. it's easily measured. Like, you just count the number of turns. It's. In a lot of the games, they also do that for you, which is nice. Yeah, it's really handy. I'm not too sure why it would be a poor metric to determine performance outside of the context of some people just don't care about it but i think you could argue that about basically anything that could be used to measure performance oh 100 like in terms of reliability right that's obviously where the extreme would be in iron man i don't think most people are iron man fire emblem games yeah especially in the the modern day where we've got things like the turn wheel and divine pulse and the dragon time crystals i think if anything, we've gone even further away from Iron Man being a reasonable standard. Um, because yeah. most people aren't... Or most people are using those. Yeah, I would definitely say in the case of Three Houses, that it, it definitely doesn't seem to be designed very much around people Iron Manning the game. You get, all your, you get most of your units so early, or can start getting them really early. Building ranks can be so important to your unit performance overall. Very few late joiners, right? Yeah, Three Houses is very much a game which is designed around you expect or it expects you to keep your units alive. It isn't expecting you to have 
multiple units die throughout the course of the game, which is just not the case with most of the others. Yeah, like even Engage, which I've I manned a couple times successfully on Maddening, I would say is much more like accessible for Iron Man's just because you actually get units dispersed throughout the entire game, right? Yeah, and there's a lot like there's a lot fewer things that I think are just there to kill you and force you to pulse. Essentially, three houses obviously had a lot of things like ambush forms, yeah, which are especially on the maddening difficulty where you're just not expected to play around those on a first playthrough. Um, even on a repeat yeah. playthrough, I I'm not memorizing all of those ambush forms even now. The amount of hours I've put into three houses, there are still somewhere I'm like, oh yeah, they spawn there. Um, <laughs> they, they, they will kill me every time and I will just pulse. Yeah, I guess going back to the actual take, I guess it depends on what we necessarily mean as well, like by performance. I think that it's a very good metric through which to judge unit performance, because obviously a unit that requires fewer turns to kill an enemy or reach the boss is obviously going to be better than one that requires training or like more rounds of combat to do the same thing. But if we're talking about like, judging player performance for people's turn counts, that's just really silly in my opinion. Yes, I do agree with that. I don't think a person who beats the game faster than somebody else is necessarily better, they've just prepared for a different style. I think the other yeah. thing that really ties into it is kind of like the game that you're talking about, right? Because in a lot of games, turn count oriented play and trying to keep your turn count low can involve making the game harder with all the planning that's needed and all of that stuff. But in others, you look at something like Three Houses, it's a lot easier to beat the maps in one turn than it is to play them out fully. Which yeah, I don't think is always much. the consistent theme throughout the throughout the series. Like something like FE4, for example, I don't necessarily... Well, FE4 is a weird example because it doesn't use RNG. So if you're familiar yeah. with the game, it becomes really easy to LTC because you just make the exact same moves and the exact same things happen every time. But mm -hmm. I think by and large games can often be harder to plan out these turn count oriented runs which is where you do start to lose that that consistency between players because three houses and i think engage as well although i'm not as well versed with the game to make this claim as confidently but i think both of those are games where it becomes a lot easier to play to a low turn count and especially one turning maps just is easier than the alternative so even if you wanted to discuss it from an ease of use perspective there's a lot of crossover there i think Yes. Um, free houses, I definitely think that's the case for. Engage, I think it starts to get really murky once you start to factor in, for instance, the existence of the well. Things like rigging the well or like accounting for well drops, I know, is a uh, source of great frustration for quite a few people over on the Fire Emblem Efficiency Discord. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. I wasn't actually thinking about the well when I said that. That's a very good point. Um, yeah. It's a giant pool of RNG, essentially, and I can imagine it is causing a lot of headaches for for efficiency-oriented players, especially in that, that early game, right, where every chapter isn't that easy to one-turn. Yeah, yes, I realize we keep on getting off on a tangent, just that, that's just because this is quite a loaded topic, I feel like. Yeah, it is, because we, we haven't even mentioned the important words yet, which I guess have to come out to, at some point, which is tier lists. Um, yes. <laughs> A lot of tier lists are oriented around turn count to some extent, even from players who might not necessarily usually play that way, um, because we do need something to separate these units out. Yeah. I do kind of agree to an extent that there might be a better way to do it that is more representative of all players, but I think it's very telling that whenever anyone creates a tier list, it will almost always involve efficiency or turn count in some way. Yes, I agree. Because it just shows that like there's no real easy way to separate these units. Because tier lists are, in essence, especially in some games, just fluff. Like They're not necessarily like, oh, you need to use these units to beat the game, or using these units is a significant impact. Like I don't think the units you use in like, three houses, for example, actually has that massive of a difference. It's more about your familiarity with builds and things like that, but you could substitute in an, an A tier unit for a C tier unit and probably get a pretty similar performance in a lot of cases. Oh, definitely, yeah. And then, obviously, I think, like, I've had a similar discussion on this series before, but the bigger issue is that tier lists a lot of the time just aren't defined as to what they're judging by and what their metrics are, which 
is always important for me. Um, I think we need to make it clear what we're judging based on whenever we do a tier list. And a lot of the times I think it comes down to the fact that these are often perceived as just being, oh, this unit beats the game faster, it's an LTC, which is a bit of a it's misconception. Not like, it's just not true. Yeah. Like, I think it's just a bit of a misconception that efficient play and LTCing are the same thing. And to a lot of people, they probably might be, because if you're quote-unquote wanting a low turn count, but you're not doing all the rigging, then what you're doing is efficient play. But it makes sense to perceive it as an LTC, right? You're trying to get a low turn count. And yeah, I mean, it's a misconception I've made in the past as well, when I've said like, oh yeah, I've done an LTC, but it's actually just like an efficiency-oriented playthrough. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an I mean, easy trap to fall into. I definitely understand why people make that, like, conflate the two things, because like, until I actually started LTCing, I thought that they would ultimately end up being pretty similar. But, mm -hmm. like, in LTCs, like, you really are trying to maximize every single thing you can. Yeah. Or within the turns that, like, you have a lot to yourself. And sometimes, if it works out better in the long term, you might end up taking, a, like, one turn extra in one chapter, because it turns out that what you get in that one chapter saves turns in the long run. Yeah. Um, and, like, in, for instance, games like GBA, FE, like, you really take the fullest advantage that you can of rescue dropping. Like, it's the difference between, like, oh yes, like, we're having Orson run with Ephraim towards the throne in Vive X versus, like, well, we're doing it in, like, this optimized way where we're dropping people where we absolutely want to. Right? Correct, correct me if I'm wrong as well, but wouldn't the GBA FE involve a lot of that weird, like, wiggling the mouse position or the cursor position around to manipulate the RNG? Is a lot of that involved that I always see in, <laughs> in various oh, yeah. ones? It definitely depends on the on like the exact rule set that people subscribe to as well, because the like the personal philosophy that I subscribe to is that like I don't enjoy doing all the arrow dancing, so that's why I do one hundred percent growths, or I or if I didn't do one hundred percent growths, I do zero percent growths. Mm -hmm. um, and I tend to just set, set the weapon hit and crit so that I hit everything that I need to, I crit everything that I need to. It's theoretically possible to do so, and I don't get hit by things that I can avoid getting hit by if it's beneficial to not get hit by them. Yeah, that's definitely fair. So, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a poor metric to determine performance. I think that's where I ultimately fall on this, so I'm going to fall on disagree, but I do think it is something that's not going to be universal to everyone. So I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I don't think there is any metric in the game that is universal to everyone and is going to reflect everyone's experience. I just think that turn count is just one way to separate units from each other. You can always go for something else, um, but what those something else's would be, it would be um, very interesting to know because I think once, like, once you start removing efficiency from it, you start getting situations like, well, if I'm playing Shadow Dragon, I can just spend 30 turns grinding Gordon on the boss, or I can mm -hmm. just broken weapon grind in in three houses, for example. And you, it's very quick, I feel, to start going from not caring about turn count to just including the grindiest things you can. You know, why not do the Tower of Volney to get Amelia to level 30 um, in like 10, 20? Yeah. And it's, uh, it's a very slippery slope in that way, right? Like once you start saying like, oh, we're not considering efficiency, I feel like it does, it can open itself up. Like it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to make those arguments, but it does open itself up to heading towards that direction, which I don't think is beneficial towards unit discussion personally. Yeah, and I feel like you can obviously, there is a middle ground there. You could say, like, I'm not playing super turn count oriented, but I'm not going to sit around grinding, but that becomes really difficult to define. Um, I've yeah. used the phrase no excessive grinding in Breaking Down pretty much since its inception, and I still don't really know what that means. <laughs> um, I <laughs> the, the What I essentially mean by it is that you don't have to grind these units to get these builds to work. I'm not expecting you to sit in Orcs battles for 20 minutes to get these builds online. But excessive grinding is different from person to person. Like, I don't tend to do any Orcs battles when I play Three Houses because I find it more fun not to. But, yep. yeah, it just becomes a bit murky, I think, like, when you start moving away from that. And I think, like, saying, right, we're just going to try and beat it in as few turns as possible within the context of a standard playthrough where we're not rigging RNG and all of that stuff is just a pretty easy way to simplify all of that down. Oh yeah, like I think I also fall on the side of like not strongly disagree, but disagree because like as you said, like I do think there probably there might be a best way of judging units, right? But yeah. I think that probably 
the amount of explanation and caveats you'd have to do before you actually start getting into like your evaluation of units. Yeah. Especially if you're the only person judging units from that metric, right? I yeah. feel like at that point it either becomes really like long or just not helpful to the because like depending on how you define it as well, like that means it can move even further away from how people might play the game. Whereas turn count is still ultimately a very easy thing for people to look at, right? Yeah, and to be honest, I think as long as your tier list is defined, you can judge it on whatever you want. As long as you say, like, this is what I'm rating the units based on, frankly, there's no wrong answer to rate units on anything. You can rate them on their hair colour for all I care. As long as your <laughs> tier list makes some sort of sense, like, as long as there's some logical structure to it, it doesn't really matter what you're judging the units by. It's when we stop defining tier lists that I think get things get a bit murky, but... Defining units by things other than turn counts is something I've been doing a lot of looking into lately and sort of thinking about because I make tier lists, but I don't really care about turn count anymore. In fact, I try to actively play to a lower turn count metric. So I think things like how much easier a unit makes the game can perhaps be a valid alternative metric. But then we get into the situation of, okay, well, is this easier for someone who's experienced with the game or for someone who's just playing the game for the first time? And there's just a lot of things that you need to define. And again, any yeah. of it's any of it's valid. You can def you can make your tier list based on any metric you want, as long as it's clear what it is. But I don't think there's inherently anything poor about using turn count as a metric. I do. Yes. The reason why I'm not coming down on strongly disagree with this one is I do think it's overused. I think it's not, or not necessarily overused. I think it's often used as the default when a lot of people don't play this way, including the people who make these lists. So yes, and I. Would agree. Yeah, and I've gone like I used to play quite turn count oriented, not LTC, but efficiency. I prefer like you know if there were two enemies near the boss, and the boss was there, and I had to kill the boss to end the map, but I only had one unit to attack. I'm not waiting around to kill those extra two enemies. I'm just killing the boss. Like that was pretty much like my attitude towards it. I would end the map in as few turns as I could within the context of that playthrough, and I've pivoted away from that. And your playstyle changes a lot. So if you're not usually playing with turn count in mind, I think it's very hard to make a tier list with turn count in mind because it is a very different playstyle. Yeah, no, it's really different. And like, there's a lot of differences as well between like people, how people would use units in an LTC compared to like efficient play. So there's like a lot of like really unintuitive things, things like how an engage, like playing according to LTC pace very much changes the way that you view the emblems mm -hmm. compared to how they might look in a more quote-unquote relaxed playstyle, right? Because, yeah. you know, why why did why do Corrin's veins matter in an LTC when you're just killing the boss anyway? You're not you're not keeping anyone away from you. You're yeah. just killing them quickly anyway. But yeah, ultimately I I disagree with <laughs> with the take. I do think that like I do think that people can focus on turn count a bit much but i do ultimately think that like people need to decide for themselves where they draw the line in following what's like meta in whatever context that means yeah i think a lot of it comes down to something which i tried to push quite a lot which is tier lists are not guides you shouldn't be like choosing the units you use off of where they're placed on a tier list because there's just a lot more intricacies there and like I can't remember how long my tier list was for Three Houses. I'm pretty sure it was like a couple of hours. And even that's not I going into... I think it was a... a couple of hours, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, even that's not going into enough detail to cover every unit to a degree to which I would say, like, okay, you've watched this tier list and now you can use all these units. Like, not even close, which is why Breaking Down exists. But I think sort of the main takeaway from this is please define your tier lists. As long as you... Yeah, please, please define your tier lists. <laughs> yeah, and... Um... If you're looking for a tier list to maybe help you or to, that is relevant to your play, try and find one that's relevant to how you play. The other people will judge the game differently to you, and I think that's kind of fine in a sense, as long as tier lists are somewhat defined. Yes, I agree. I agree. That was a very long discussion about turn count. It really was. <laughs> <laughs> We're like 20 minutes in, and we pretty much only spoke about the... the well, we only spoke about the first take, where we both fell on disagree, which is, well... We're agreeing from the get-go, that's a good start. Yes, it is, it is. <laughs> so, our next take is that bonus EXP should come back in later games as it's the best way to solve the benching problem. Hmm. I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure what the benching problem is. 
<laughs> Same. Okay, I'm glad like, I'm not the only one. I was kind of hoping my eyes could be opened, but I'm not. Yeah, because, I mean, the premise of this is that benching is a problem. And firstly, I mean, is it a problem? I don't, uh, I don't know. It's... I feel like, I mean, I don't know. I know that obviously there are some games where I can see some pretty severe deployment crunches, such as FE7 Hector Hard Mode yep. is rather infamous for its deployment crunches. The Soul Mark of Engage is pretty <laughs> well known for how much it can limit the units that you're allowed to bring into the chapters where you recruit like 5 billion units yep. on like two maps. And I think a really key thing about both of those games is there isn't really a clear way to get experience into your units that are benched, right? There's no yeah. grind. Well, I guess you kind of can grind and engage, but it's kind of weird. Um, especially yeah, on Maddening. It's weird. Yeah. It's weird. I'm still not entirely sure how the, the skirmishes work on Maddening, so it's definitely a bit all over the place. Mm -hmm. And there's like no easy way yet yeah, to get experience into those units. And in both of those games, your deployment doesn't crunch and stay crunched. It fluctuates. It will drop, then it will come back up, and then it will drop again, and then it will come back up. Which is very different to something like, say, Three Houses, where your deployment pretty much only increases throughout the game. You start off with 10. Unless you're going Silver Snow, it stays as 10, pretty much, um, as yep. of Chapter 1. And then it eventually expands to 12 for the last few chapters mm. which and in a game like three houses again you have things like agitants and a lot of your investment into units is done outside of combat through tutoring and through assigning your units their goals and group tasks and all of that stuff so it is quite a drastic difference depending on what game we're talking about in a way yeah i mean i guess the thing for instance like with engage as well is that like if you go into power logs, there's often like just random like deployment crunches, which means you can't bring along various units that you were planning on using or that you are planning on using in your final team. Um, I remember that in chapter 20, the uh, Fog of War Cathedral map, uh, like you suddenly have one less deployment slot than you had in the previous map. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's, the... it's definitely yeah. weird how they do all of that, but I'm not necessarily sure that there's a, a benching problem so to speak i yeah i think in like obviously we're talking about specific games in this context and obviously i think that it probably does benefit from us talking about specific games because like, in the general case like i feel like it depends as well on like what the unit distribution and quality is like whether it would be like quote unquote worthwhile to bring back a unit who's been benched for some time right yeah because like in fe7 like you could use Urk. And like maybe he'll turn out being good, but there's a very strong chance he just turns out being worse than Pent when he shows up, right? Yeah. And, and that has nothing to do with benching him. That has to do with the quality of the unit who joins you later. Yeah, one I really like the bonus EXP in the Delius games. I'm just gonna establish that early on. Um I think it's a great feature and I think it really encourages players to go out of their way to complete quote unquote side objectives that sort of dictate how the game wants you to play, right? If it wants you to play quickly, it will reward you for clearing the map quickly. If it wants you to, say, stealth it through the prison level, it will reward you for doing that. Not killing monks, not killing the mercenaries on chapter 10. It does... Yep. Or chapter 11, sorry. It does a lot of things to sort of guide how you... how the game wants you to play, and I think that's a very good way of doing it. It rewards things like faster play, or completing side objectives with a clear, tangible reward that everyone will appreciate. Experience. But yes. I also think it can cause some issues in the fact that, like... So, even in my FE9 Iron Man, for example, I got to the Pitfall Bridge, and I can't remember if I just got an extra deployment slot or what, but that's when I started streaming the playthrough, and someone was like, you should use Rolf. So I just dumped, like, 3,000 bonus EXP to Rol <laughs> into Rolf, uh, forged him a weapon, and now this unit, who hadn't been used throughout the entire game, was competitive. And yes. able to compete with my units who had been used throughout the entire game and it kind of makes using weaker units like that like super easy like you look at some rolf is obviously a bit of a meme example because he's not a great unit but you look at yeah. someone like <laughs> astrid who joins at level one with the paragon ability late in the game and you kind of get this impression that they're meant to be like an s you have to like grind them up despite them being not late in the game but you know towards the mid game later than you would want a level one unit and yeah you don't have to grind them up at all. You just give them bonus EXP and now they're just really good. And it does yeah, kind of circumvent I... having to train units in a way, which I'm not entirely sure is cohesive with the narrative. 
and like, with gameplay. Like, I think, I, I, yeah, because I mean, I think that like part of the fun of using like once again, quote unquote, bad units is getting them through that training process, right? Like yeah. it's the zero to hero arc. Like if you just skip that, um, it doesn't have the same impact, does it? Yeah. So. It's one of the things I really like about FE4, which is basically all of your units in that game will see a lot of combat and will see a lot of action. So when your units find their way to like really good growths, it's because of things that they've done themselves. If you get really lucky and you're quote unquote lucky, if you play the game in such an order that someone like who wouldn't typically be one of your better units ends up becoming one, like let's say Ira just gains a bunch of strength or something like that then she's done it off of her own merit. And I quite like that. I quite like that, oh, she killed a bunch of enemies and now she's really strong. Now, obviously, FE4 is also helped out by the arena in this aspect, which is a great way for units to gain experience and keep up with your party, even if they're not seeing as much combat as the mounts. Yep. I agree. I think... I think... Sorry, Karen. I think it also probably depends on, like, what bonus experience would be given for, right? Like, my understanding for at least some of the maps in, like, Path of Radiance is that, like, bonus experience be given for, like, undeploying units as well. Yep. So, like, I guess if we're saying that, like, benching thing is a problem, which I don't know it is, right? Um, depending on how, like, extreme the Bex would dump was for, like, not deploying units, I guess it theoretically could swing the direction where it encourages you to bench units in earlier chapters. Yeah, and I think that is kind of the thing, right? Like, it encourages you to bench units, but then it gives you some XP as a reward so you can catch them back up so they don't miss out. It kind of almost asks you, like, hey, make the game a little harder for yourself, but you won't miss out on the experience from it, right? Like, these yeah. units can still... You can just give them 50 XP and you'll be... They'll be right back where they probably would have been anyway. Yeah, I do think that bonus experience adds, like, a really cool, like, long-term strategic element to, like, the tactical called map-to-map gameplay of Fire Emblem, so I would be interested in how it would be implemented and received in a future Fire Emblem entry, for sure. Yeah, I I definitely would like to see bonus EXP come back. I think it's a really well done mechanic in general and helps out a lot in terms of just dictating how the game wants you to play and rewarding you for that, right? It basically says, you made the game harder for yourself, you know, you beat the map in five turns. You probably left a lot of enemies on the map. Well, we don't want to punish you for that. Here's some bonus EXP to catch our units back up. Because you did a good thing. You cleared a level quickly. You got rid of a boss, a threat, in a short manner of time. But in a, as a result, you missed out on some EXP. Well, that doesn't seem fair. You shouldn't be punished for ending a level quicker. Here's some bonus EXP to make up for that. Uh, similarly with the stealth section on um, Chapter 10 of Path of Radiance, it would be very strange if the game was like, hey, you should stealth this level, now you don't get any experience <laughs> for it. That would be, that would be odd. So it gives you- It would you, be rather strange, Yeah, yes. it gives you this huge pile of bonus EXP to, to catch you back up. Yeah. So I guess- I like I guess my bonus EXP. This case. Yeah, I like bonus EXP. I'm just not sure it's the best way to solve the benching problem or if, even if there is a benching problem. So I'm kind of yeah. divided, which is why I'm struggling to come down one way or the other. Yeah, I, I same here. Like, I agree that bonus experience should come back in later games. I disagree with the, like, reasoning behind it. Yes. <laughs> hmm. This is, hmm. this is tricky. I think I'm going to come down on disagree purely because I don't think it's the best way to solve the benching problem. Um... Yes, I think I will also fall on disagree, because I feel like the, the overall premise here is that there is a benching problem, we need to solve it, this is the way to solve it, and I don't agree with that. Yeah, I kind of think that if your units haven't done anything, like, in a battle, they probably shouldn't be good. Like, yes. I think that's fine. I don't yeah, think I that's also... something we need to rectify. I also just don't think that every unit has to be a long-term unit. Yeah, like, I agree with that. Like, you can have a unit that's useful in the early game, or useful in the mid-game for a few chapters, and then, like, in quote-unquote optimal play, like, isn't used anymore. And if you want to continue using them at that point, like, they're your project, and obviously that's perfectly fine, but I don't think that, like, necessarily they sh everyone should have the same returns for investment. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. So, yeah, I'll come down and disagree on this take, but I do want bonus XP to come back. Mm -hmm. So... 
Take number three. Having the possibility to grind for levels as an option like Awakening and Fates do does not harm the game. Now, when this take was submitted, there was also mention of Echoes and Sacred Stones, which put in forced grind maps, like where you might just have to walk into them. Although I don't think they actually are forced in Sacred Stones. I'm pretty sure you can- They are not retreat. forced in Sacred Stones. Yeah. They are not forced. I was going to say, I, I, I've played that game for so long, but now I'm starting to doubt my own re like recollection. You can just retreat from the ones that like spawn in front of you, right? Like if they spawn in your path. Yeah, you can. You can just Don't retreat. worry. Like yeah. quite literally in the L in the LTC, I do that a couple of times because I literally have to because I'm boxed in. <laughs> yeah. So what we're talking about here are grind maps that are optional. So like even in from Sacred Stones, we could look at something like the Tower of Volney or the Lagadu ruins or the skirmishes around the map or things like that or orcs battles in three houses. Things like that. I just other games that I'm a little bit more familiar with than Awakening or Fates, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is meant when it says harm the game? I guess. Like, I guess I've got an idea of what it might mean, right? Like, in terms of it might hurt the level curve. Uh, it might hurt like how difficult the en and like I guess by extension how difficult the enemies are to beat with your team at like a set point in the story right mm -hmm. yeah um, so i think this is an interesting take because i understand why people come to this conclusion i just think they're wrong uh, like, yes <laughs> same <laughs> um i fully get where people go to the oh you don't have to do if you don't want to grind then don't grind it's optional the problem sort of arises when the only reason to not do something is i don't want to do it like, there's no functional reason to use anyone other than Seth in the early game of FE8, because if I want to use anyone else, I'm pretty sure it's both faster and easier to just bulldoze through the early chapters with Seth, and then train Franz in the Tower of Valny. And it takes a lot um... of effort out of the game, like... I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that, but it's definitely true that, like, if you were trying to, like, train someone quickly, in terms of turn count, yeah, ignoring the turn counts of previous chapters, the tower is definitely the fastest way of doing that. Yeah. So, I think you just end up in this situation where you don't have to make decisions to use your weaker units in actual maps, which yes. is usually an element of challenge of training that unit. If you want to get a unit up to speed, you have to use them in an actual level, and then as a reward, you usually get a very strong unit at the end of it, a unit who's had a lot of investment put into them, and comes out of it very strong. You look at someone like Ross or Franz in FE8 again, and they come out really well when you train them, but training them means not using your strongest units at the time. And Yeah, it means sandbagging your, very, like, your, your carry unit, essentially. Yeah, and I think there's been a lot of discussion around grinding in Fire Emblem throughout the years, so I don't know how much I can really add to it, but... I think, in general, the option to grind just presents a, an easy answer to how do I use all these units. And for me, I like that decision making. I like that challenge of, okay, if I want to use this unit who starts off weaker but grows well, I have to train them up. And mm -hmm. I'm just going to plug another piece of content out here, but I think Troops has a really good video on this regarding FE8 um, and why basically the, the option for grind maps hurts that game quite badly. Um, he uses Coleman as an example and you know, why would I use Colm in combat when I can just train him in the tower effortlessly? Why would I take risks on an actual map when you can just train him elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, FEA is a bit of a weird one because like, I think that quite a few of the units that do join, if you think about the fact of the existence of the tower, it makes a lot more sense why they join at the level they do. Mm -hmm. Like Marissa, like there's no reason why she should join as a level five Myrmidon in a game where there wasn't like the tower. But because the tower exists, you look at her and you're like, Oh, I can kind of see why they decided to add this unit to game at this point in time. I just don't think that, um, you know, it was a good idea to have the tower there in the first place. I don't like necessarily the effect that it had. I mean, okay, I don't think that all units need to be equally balanced, right? Yeah. But I also don't think that, like, it was beneficial for the existence of the tower to kind of enable the addition of such, like, obviously kind of like bad slash joke slash project units to exist, I think. Yeah, I mean, Marissa is a particularly odd example in Sacred Stones because you get a level 5 Myrmidon on Chapter 5 and then you get a level 5 Myrmidon on Chapter 12, which is very strange, even within the context of one game that's obviously significantly behind. And it's not like Astrid where you get an ability like Paragon to help catch them up or anything like that. 
um, as well as safe chip and everything like that that Astra gets. It's more just a case of you just get a unit who's drastically underleveled and you can grind them up if you want to. Yeah, you can grind them up if you want to, and even at the point where she joins, she arguably has um, worse bases than Joshua, who literally joined like seven chapters earlier. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she does just have worse bases yeah. than Joshua. I think that. she does. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a strange one, but I think like optional grind maps, they remove a lot of decision making, like on map, in the moment decision making, because... Again, that I tend to play without using these maps. I mentioned it earlier, but I don't do Orcs Battles when I play Three Houses. But if I did, like, why would I bother trying to train a unit in, say, Brigand or Archer or any other class that I'm looking to master within actual maps in the game when I can just do it in an Orcs Battle, right? I can just yeah. slam everyone in Cavalier and Pegasus Knight for the real maps and then train them in Orcs Battles to master Brigand, master Archer, especially when you can do 12 Orcs Battles a month, which is just silly. So many, so many. Like, I know that the grind battles in Three Houses are not unlimited, but for all intents and purposes, they are. If you're doing more than 12 battles a month, I don't know how. Especially because I those think... battles are, and this is kind of typical of these grind maps, actually. These battles are generally quite unengaging. Um, oh yeah, they're I... so boring. I really hate them. I've been playing through Echoes at the minute, and those dungeon maps are not fun. They're... Yeah, they are something. They're... It's they just... are something. It's just a square with a couple of rocks on it and like four monsters. And I I don't get who this is for. <laughs> like I don't know who <laughs> enjoys playing those chat those those battles. Like it's it's just time consuming and not particularly fun. Yeah, I, I agree on the uh, dungeon battles in um Shadows of Lentia. I mean Okay, we both know the reason why it's there is because they were there in Geisen, and, and it's a very faithful remake to Gaiden. <laughs> well, true, it, it, it is. Uh, I haven't played Gaiden, but you can tell that a lot of a lot of the things that are in Echoes aren't modern concepts. <laughs> yeah, having having recently uh, played through Gaiden myself, and uh, actually going to be releasing a uh, compilation of painful moments that I had during my playthrough of Gaiden, <laughs> there's definitely a lot that was kept similar between the two games. Uh, so, like, in a way, part of me prefers, um, Sacred Echoes, mm -hmm. uh, which is Shadows of Lentia kind of, like, demade slash reimagined in fe 8s engine, uh, because, like, it doesn't have... Well, okay, it does have the dungeon maps, but, like, they're much more, like, curated enemy layout. It's not literally just, like, a square with five dudes and all of your dudes, um... I also do like the fact that it doesn't have the overworld encounters. I'm personally not a fan of them because, like, they can be manipulated to be avoided entirely. So I'm not, a f I don't know, I'm not a fan of things that have a chance of suddenly appearing on the map, especially if, like, there's a way to avoid them from showing up in the first place. Yeah, things appearing on the map has definitely done some things in Echoes recently. Um, in <laughs> yes, Echoes it most us certainly has. <laughs> I, I have watched it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's been a time. But, um, I guess going back to, like, the Fate's Awakening, like, mentioned in the take specifically, mm -hmm. I do think that, like, in Conquest specifically, where there's obviously, like, no option for, like, these grind maps, like in Birthright, like, it means that managing, like, your support points, for instance, is much more important, because that decides when you can unlock children, and so their power logs, which is an extra source of experience, and those obviously scale to the point in the story that you're at, so I think that, like, if you had the option to grind for levels in Conquest as freely as you would in Birthright, I think it harms, like, the strategic planning of the game, because in that game, like, planning around, like, when you're going to unlock the power logs, when you're going to do the power logs, is such an important part of playing Conquest. Mm-hmm. And I think another thing that, like, is very much in line with that is if you don't have the opportunity to infinitely grind, the game and, obviously, the devs, will have a much clearer read on how strong you are at any given point. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you're trying to have to like match your balance for players who do grind and who do do these optional maps to get stronger so that the game doesn't just become a breeze for them, but also at the same time you're balancing it for players who don't grind and don't do optional maps. And one of those is going to lose out in that way. Um, oh yeah. I think, in general, this isn't strictly 100% of the time true, but the closer a game keeps you 
to like a baseline for how strong you are at any given point the easier it is for the devs to balance in that regard like if they can have a better idea of how strong you are they can e more easily make the enemies a similar strength and mm. something that's just came to mind as well especially in a game like sacred stones is now this isn't really a problem in the more recent entries but there is no indication to the player as to whether or not you're supposed to grind in more recent entries like three houses or engage we kind of get these level ranges which are expected to be in to do a map you don't get mm. that in the older games like you, you're just kind of expected to go in obviously in echoes you get like the unit ratings things which i'm no idea how accurate those are but if it's anything like i have the... no idea i don't even think i know how exactly that's calculated <laughs> no i have no idea i think it's total stats if i'm not mistaken i think it is total stats i think it's that total stats, stats of the but... parties yeah but it could well be something else entirely like, i have no and you could tell me that and i would believe you yeah like it could be it could be anything but like these level ranges they're often wrong um, like, anyone attempting to do black market scheme on the lower end of its level ranges are going to be in for a bad time in Three Houses. You're going to get yeah, bullied. Yeah, a real bad time. Yeah. A you... real bad time. <laughs> but, uh, similarly, if you go to the upper end of some of these entries, you can just put auto battle on and go make a drink or something. Like, also, black market scheme. See, I have used Happy. No, you important. haven't. You, you haven't used Happy. <laughs> you, you really should use her. Um, she's a really good unit. <laughs> it's my, true, she is a good unit. <laughs> my sole existence on YouTube is to gaslight people into thinking you've never used Happy. <laughs> That's the only reason I'm here. But, yeah, I just think, by and large... Also, the one thing I haven't really addressed is, like, if you want a possibility for grind for levels, there are better options than grind maps. Yes. We've touched on one with bonus EXP, and I still think the best option. If you want to grind for levels in a way that actually requires you to do a lot of gameplay, and it takes effort, and you have to do it well, you have to play well, you can't just switch your brain off and let your unit enemy face 30 monsters for a turn, then yep. bring back the FE4 Arena. It's a really good way of doing it, and it worked really well. And yeah, think, it, you have to actually pay well. attention, Like you have to manage your units through this arena, and the further you get, the more EXP and gold you get as a reward. This is just the best grind tool that they've ever put into a Fire Emblem game. It's great. Mm -hmm. Bring this back. I think I think as well as an example, like, from a more, like, recent entry than FE4 or the Talia's games, is, like, in Engage, for instance, like, the Mercurius and um, the Parthia give you extra experience for, like, using it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of optimizations that have been done in, like, LTCs or just general efficient engage play, yeah. where maximizing how much you can get out of those two weapons really does, like, define the experience curve in the parts of the game where it's relevant. Yeah, so, like, you can look at you something know, you like don't, you don't Professor's need Guidance extra, as well. You don't need these extra, you don't need these extra maps yeah. to, like, have a way of gaining extra experience. There's so many other avenues. I do think Engage does do something quite right with the grind maps in a sense, though, which is they're really hard. <laughs> like, <laughs> they are. They can be really hard. Like, have you um, have you seen the cha chapter eleven's map as a skirmish, where it's quite literally a fog of war map with tons of flyers, and your entire team is spread out across the entire verticality of the I map. have not, but that sounds like an incredible time. Like fog <laughs> of war hunting by daybreak combination yep. excellent but yeah i was uh, when engage first came out i obviously had my own blind maddening playthrough but at the same time one of my friends was playing through on hard mode and we would call on discord and i'd sort of watch them play and offer some input they tried a skirmish map on hard mode and it was harder than anything i'd done on maddening up until that point like it was genuinely a challenge to try and get through those maps because the enemies are so aggressive they all They're just really rush aggressive. you and it's like uh this is hard like really really challenging and it was definitely yeah it's i think that's definitely like almost a better way to go with grind reps like okay you can grind for some experience but you're going to be in for a time like you you, bet, you better bring your a game like it's it's my understanding that that's similar to how skirmishes work in at least like awakening lunatic specifically mm -hmm. where like you can do them but the enemies are gonna have really high stats so you're not gonna enjoy yourself yeah i think that's like definitely a stark contrast to what we see in something like free houses or in gate or um sacred stones where the skirmishes in that game are um they exist they're, they're very easy 
Um, yeah, exist. So I think overall, do I think I think they do harm the game? Like I think they make they, I think they harm the game. I think they make it less clear for the player. I think they really impact like the devs' perception of what how strong a player is at any given point. And more to the point, I think they just remove a lot of decision making for the player in terms of if you want to use this unit, you have a limited time, limited opportunity, and it kind of removes EXP as a resource because it's now yes. unlimited. It almost replaces EXP with time because if you want EXP, you have unlimited of it. Just spend time to get it. And yeah, I think I think it very much like like you said because the limiting factor really becomes time in that instance. Like it definitely affects as well. Like what discussions of the game will end up being because i mean like obviously we've mentioned that like in Taylor's turn count tends to get mentioned pretty often right yeah but like if if we end up like if it ends up being like commonly accepted that like people will grind endlessly such as in like the various skirmish maps in like the easier games in the series or like games not necessarily that are easier but have easier skirmishes or grinding maps right mm -hmm. then like you know, it doesn't just harm, like, the developer's understanding of, like, what people will have. It also affects, like, players' own understanding of what, like, other players will be having at that point in time as well. Like, what is reasonable for a person to have at that point in time. Yeah, I definitely agree. So I'm going to come down and strongly disagree with this one. I think this can actually be very bad for the game. And yeah. I don't mind like an option to grind, but it definitely needs to be somewhat limited and it definitely needs to be a lot more controlled than we see it in a lot of games. The possibility for grind for levels just, yeah, like it can just remove experience as a resource and managing your yeah. experience is a huge part of a lot of the Fire Emblem games. Yeah, I mean like grind for levels, grind for like weapon experience and I mean I guess in the case of like all games that aren't like engage with like literally a fixed like weapon level of some sort right mm -hmm. um so yeah i'd have to come down and strongly disagree here as well like i just think it harms like i just think it harms too many things surrounding the game whether it's the design thereof in terms of like how hard are these enemies are going to be statted what units are you going to get given at this point in the game and like just to, like even after release like how people perceive the game and how discussion around it goes yeah, one thing I will say is I would quite like to see maps like skirmish maps present in the main game that don't give any XP. Like, just give all the enemies that engage ability which stops them giving out experience so that you can test strategies and things more reasonably. Like, mock battle style things where you can just throw a unit in, see how they perform against enemies that are pretty well scaled to your time. Like, I'd like to see that a lot more. But, mm -hmm. like, I'd like to see, I guess, like, skirmishes are a concept I'm fine with. I just don't like them as a grinding tool. Yes. I, th I do think that, like, they would provide quite a handy way of, um, and they do provide quite a handy way as well in, like, gameplay demonstration videos and stuff. Yeah. They're good for, like, stress testing your units and things like that, but I think grinding tools just make the game a lot messier than it needs to be. Yeah, in every possible way, really. Mm-hmm. So, I think we can pretty much wrap that take up there. Again, another one that we went into for quite a period. Um, so... I mean, it's, it's something that I think, I think most Fire Emblem players are going to have an, an opinion on grinding of some sort, yeah. True, <laughs> true, they definitely are. Something that's just, again, it's not one of those topics that's commonly discussed throughout the community, so it, it makes sense that we have committed a lot of time to it. So, take number four. Effective weaponry should return as a much more important mechanic than what it has been in the last few games. Hmm. It's a weird one, right? Yeah. Like, hmm, I don't know, because I, it's not like, it's not like any games have really been going back to, like, the FE7 moment in, like, the localized English release where, like, there's just double effectiveness, right? Yeah. Like, that was definitely not kind to a bunch of the effective weaponry in that game. Yeah, definitely, like... The ones that are good tend to be weapons that are really good anyway, and now they're really good against these units, like the Mani Kati or the Wolf Bale, right? Like, yeah. These are like, solid base weapons. Oh, look, now they do more damage to these units. Yeah, and I mean, like, they were always, like, pretty good anyway, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
where I think this does get interesting is where you consider effective weaponry for the opponents, which I think has definitely taken quite a fall off in some of the recent games, where it used to be quite common. Now, there are situations in the past where effective weaponry was used very cruelly, and I'm glad we're not in that stage anymore. Um, Sacred Stein springs to mind with the first introduction of a horse slayer being in Fog of War, which is... Oh, it was a halberd. It's the halberd on the Yeah, that's so the one, yeah. It's the, yeah. It's the halberd on the... Um... <laughs> I agree, though. I agree. It's, it's mean. <laughs> yeah, like, this weapon that you don't know exists is on an enemy that you can't see. And, yeah, that wasn't nice. Especially when what is effective against are your highest move units. That's certainly a decision that was made. But, by yeah. and large, I think effective weaponry makes it a lot more interesting to play around the enemies. I agree, I agree. Like, I think that effect of weaponry being, like, not omnipresent, because I think that's a bit too much. I don't like what some ROM hacks do, where um, it feels like there's an effective weapon on, like, every other enemy, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I do definitely feel like they should be more widely dispersed than they are. Yeah, I think, like, especially when it, like, when it comes to enemies, effective weapons are underutilized. I think from a player perspective, they're kind of fine. I know they're, like, a bit weaker and engaged, but in Three Houses, they were super relevant. Like, especially oh, things yeah. like the Horse Slayer, the Hammer, the Rapier. Like, these are very impactful weapons. Okay, the Armor Slayer is still bad, but, like, what are you gonna <laughs> do? Yeah, I mean, like, in Three Houses, like you said, like, effective damage, very important. Like, I mean, everyone talks about, like, Lysithia and Dark Spikes against the Death Knight. Yeah. Or, like, the neat tech in chapter six of Shamir, base Shamir with Knight Nila and the Lantern Ruin yep. being able yep. to one shot him, right? Mm -hmm. Um Yeah. Definitely when you said when like you said the take, I was thinking a bit more initially from like the player perspective, but you're completely right. Like especially in games like Engage where a lot of times like enemies on average will have like higher strength stats than like your non high strength units, right? Like, I feel like there's a distinct lag in a lot of cases of, like, oh, a horse slayer or a hammer, especially forged one. I mean, obviously, they don't they don't have forged ones. Like, that's where the lag comes from in some cases, right? Yeah, definitely. And just by giving the opponents these weaponries, you just have to think a little bit more when you're playing. The only potential issue I do see is that we do kind of enter skill emblem territory where you're having to manually check every person's inventory. Um, yes. to see what weapons they've got. Now, I think some games do a much better job of telegraphing this by putting, like, a big red exclamation mark over an enemy who's got effective damage on you. Um, I think mm -hmm. Engage does this as well, actually. Um, I believe it does, yes. Which I think is definitely a better way to do it. I think things being clearly telegraphed to the player and removing a lot of that tedium of having to manually check every enemy is definitely a better way to go about it. They could just add a HUD icon that says, like, hey, this person's effective against cavalry or something like it's it's a problem that can be worked around but by and large yeah i think effective weaponry makes the game more interesting and i'd like it to be more important than what it has been maybe not in the last few games but than it has been throughout the series yeah i i would agree with that yeah because like my immediate thought with it was like well like obviously in engage um past a certain point uh unless you really forge them, like, cav and armor effective weaponry, like, really doesn't do all that much. Uh, but then equally, like, you know, everyone loves the fact that warriors have, like, bow access, uh, the radiant bow threshold for okoing all of the flyers in the game with an mm -hmm. appropriately forged and engraved radiant bow is literally 13 magic, yep. if you're not willing to slap on, like, a magic boosting emblem ring. Yeah. One thing that has just came to mind, um, I mentioned Three Houses earlier and how I think it has pretty good use of effective weaponry. One where it definitely doesn't is that that bow effectiveness on flyers, like when the enemy is effective on your flyers, just doesn't matter because of dismounting. Oh yeah, it does not. Like, that's some... Dismounting, it was cool to have, it makes a lot of sense, never bring it back. That thing was incredibly broken. Like, it removed the one weakness that flyers have over your grounded units. It also you know, got rid of a lot of terrain penalties that would normally affect horses over infantry. Mm -hmm. I 
quite truthfully believe that dismounting should never return in any Fire Emblem game because being mounted comes with downsides as well and the ability it sh to... It should, it should. Yeah, exactly. You get that extra move and you get Kanto and all this other stuff, but coming with that should be some downsides and the ability to just turn those downsides off when you want to is a little bit broken. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, I'm currently playing through... Um... Fe three, which has, uh, which does also let you like dismount mm -hmm. like on outdoor maps as you please, and then like remount. Uh, but like the way that it does dismounting when you're indoors, where it literally just forces everyone to mount off it, I think is a more like if you're going to have dismounting be part of the game. I don't think it should be an optional thing. I think it should be something that like can get forced on the player at like potentially inopportune moments. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. So. I'm going to come down on agree on this take. I would like effective weaponry to be m much more important than it has been in the last few games. Yeah, I'm going to come down on agree as well, because I definitely think that like the enemies could stand to utilize it a bit better. Yes, definitely. I think that's the main area where it's been underutilized. It could be done more for the players as well, especially in a game like Engage, but I think by and large, the enemies utilizing effective weaponry is really what I'm looking at with this take. Same. I think especially, I think, I do think that like, like, obviously I've said that with, like, how good armor effects weaponry and engage, but, like, if you do forge it, like, you can still get it to do a good amount of things, and that's just not a resource the enemy, like, does take advantage of. Like, they don't forge, they don't have the engraves, right? Like, if they're not gonna have them, they should at least, like, have some way of dealing meaningful damage to a lot of your units, I think. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. So, I think that about wraps up that take, and we've got one more to go. And this one is one that was submitted by me and doesn't come from around the community. So, everyone should use Happy even though you haven't. <laughs> strongly I'm agree? I'm going to have to come down and strongly agree with that, yes. You strongly agree that you haven't used Happy? Excellent, right? No! Quickly moving on. <laughs> so, the actual real final take. Fire Emblem would benefit from more direct sequels. <laughs> so this My... is when i say direct sequels just to clarify i don't mean games that take place in the same universe i'm talking like games that directly follow on from each other you look at fe9 and fe10 as the obvious example uh fe6 and 7 like a prequel scenario is fine too mm -hmm. but yeah. you don't mean something like um like uh Marth's games and awakening happening on the same continent yeah exactly gotcha I... Hmm. Okay, I mean, I guess it's probably easiest to start looking at the two examples with the caveat that I haven't been able to finish playing either the Telly's games, so any of my understanding, anything that I say about it is based off of, like, my understanding from being, like, part of the community, like, what people say about it, right? Yeah. Um, so FE6, FE7... I don't know, I think I feel like if anything, like, Alib's law was possibly hurt by... FE7 being introduced later as a prequel just because of the various plot discrepancies, shall we say, of that game. Yeah, I love FE7, but I'm not going to talk about his plot. I dislike the plot of FE7, and I haven't finished FE6, um, but I, I find it hard to believe that this game wouldn't harm FE6's plot, um, unless FE6's plot is equally as nonsensical. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I've i played FE6 a couple times, and, like, the plot isn't necessarily, like, anything stellar by Fire Emblem standards, right? But, like, it's simple, it does its job well, it didn't need this complication of everything that FE7 brings to it, I don't think. Yeah, that's definitely fair. I think there's a lot of merit to that, like, especially in the sense of if the sequel isn't necessarily planned from the beginning then mm -hmm. throwing it in there can definitely distort things. Even if, like, it was done as a sequel and not as a prequel, like, you end up in these strange situations where essentially what the plot ends up being is not what it was intended to be from the start. Yeah. Yeah, it just sort of ends up getting a bit warped somehow. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. But... Um... I do think the direct yeah. sequels can actually benefit the games in a lot of ways too. I think this is mostly evident in Tellius, where it does a lot to expand upon the world, and we actually get to see what happens after the conflict and the impact of the player's actions in the first game, where that leads the world in the second, and 
I know there are a lot of games where people would have really liked this. I know a lot of people were clamoring for a Three Houses sequel. Um, oh god, no. Please no. You, you mean you don't want more discussion <laughs> about war crimes? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want Fire Emblem's take on what happens with the downfall of the church? You, you don't oh think that's god. something Fire Emblem... You don't think that would be good for the community? Uh, <laughs> um, I actually started playing Fire Emblem like a good like a few years like after Three Houses came out, and I still don't like the discussions that happened about it. Today. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't um, I don't need to see Reddit and Twitter debating on any of that. I've already seen too much of it from Three Houses, but I do think it would have been interesting to see like where the world goes in those sorts of games and like. Especially in the case of a lot of games, what happens prior to the conflicts as well would be something that's very interesting to see. Yeah, I think that, like, um, I mean, going into a game that I actually do, I have actually played, uh, and therefore I'm not just speculating with, as I would do with um, Tellius. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it would be interesting to maybe, like, like, I think that, like, Conquest's plot, as much as Conquest's plot could really, um, you know, actually benefit from anything, like, it would benefit slightly from, like, actually being able to see what Garen was like before the uh, coopification, if you will. Yeah, definitely. And I say definitely, I haven't finished Conquest, so I have no idea. But I'll, I'll assume that you're telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it gives a lot of opportunity for world building. I think it mainly works in the games where that makes sense. And yes, the worlds where that makes sense. Like, as much as I can laugh at not wanting a Fogelin sequel. I mean, I guess we got Three Hopes, that's not so much a sequel as an ultimate reality. But Yeah. Yeah, as much as I can laugh at that, at least I think it's a world that would have been worth exploring more. Like, I would have wanted Definitely. to see what happened with Fogelin after Three Houses. Like, if it weren't a game with, um, like, so many different, like, routes and also just such polarizing online discussion, like, I, I think it would be interesting to kind of, like, see what the outcome of it would be because like you know it would be like interesting to see for instance like in the crimson flower eventuality like you know edel god's got all these views about what she thinks like Fodlan should be like and especially if uh spoilers for free houses i guess like you don't cure her uh, her crest cancer like mm -hmm. how does like what outcome is that is there like some generations down the line maybe like, does anything that she tried to do actually stick? Was there any point in what she was doing at all? Yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting one. Like, there's a lot of directions plots in these games could go, and it's fun to theorycraft over, but it would be nice to have some concrete answers in a lot of situations. Yeah, I mean, I guess that, like... I, I'm not necessarily that interested in seeing that many, like, direct sequels, because I'm ultimately here for, like, the gameplay. Mm -hmm. So, like, if there's going to be a lot of discussion that like, do's the plot would take away from discussion around the gameplay, I'm personally not in favour of it. So that's why, like, I'm not in favour of there being, like, a Fodlan sequel proper. Like, I think that Free Hopes is probably, like, the furthest that anything should be done with Fodlan, because, like, it still gives us, like, more chance to see what the world would, um, turn out like without canonizing any of the paths. And that includes as well, like, in Free Hopes' endings as, um, as certainly written as they were, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> How would you feel about, say, a sequel based, oh, sorry, a prequel based in Fodland that goes over, say, the the war against Nemesis from Saros's POV? That one, I think, would actually, like, okay, it was always going to be interesting because Fodland is a setting which has, like, quite intricate, like, lore and world building, right? Yeah. And, like, even though she's not necessarily the most popular character, like, Rhea does have, like, a messy like motivation and it would be like interesting to see like what the direct cause of that was and how like necessarily warped it became over the years with that additional context right mm -hmm. so like i would be i would be actually down for that like i think that there would be a way of doing that which like like it, w it couldn't cause like discourse around like um like the free houses lords hopefully because they haven't been born for a thousand years yeah i guess this might be like stretching the definition of a direct sequel when they're thousands of years apart but i think <laughs> it also avoids the major fe7 fe6 issue which is where'd the cast go <laughs> like yeah. where's they're like where'd... what happens to this person's like 
parents. Yeah, where are Lynn and Irk and Sarah and all these other people who just aren't in FE6 and never get mentioned because they weren't even conceptualized at the time? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's... <laughs> It definitely solves that problem when, like, the initial plot... It still has characters we recognise, it'll still have Seth and Flayne and Rhea and all those others, but it, it removes the reason why a lot of them wouldn't be there. Yeah. I think... I guess... I mean, I haven't played FE5 yet, but I have played FE4, and I think that, like, the idea of, like, the kind of, like, mid call that, mm -hmm. um, like, FE5 is, is, like, potentially interesting as well, because from what I know of it, I know that, um, like, because... It can involve like um like it can involve some like actual like kids that inherit things in FE4, but it can also like obviously like in FE4 playthroughs you can potentially like have a substitute run, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Like it just means that like this is a potential like timeline in which these things happen. I've been told that um there are some things that don't necessarily line up between the timelines of FE4 and FE5. And I think that's fine because like it's more contained it's got very different mechanics as well like it's not the case like in fe6 fe7 where like they both operate according to like gba fe like gameplay but one is markedly much harder than the other yeah i guess that's um, another thing these... because in both yeah. of the situations where we've got these sequels one of the games is significantly harder than the other like the, if you yeah. look at like the two main ones being fe6 fe7 and fe9 fe10 there is a notable increase in difficulty in both of those games. Like, even across easier difficulties, I feel, especially in the case of, like, mm -hmm. FE10. Um, I've been playing FE10 normal mode through. Now it's in a bit of a weird context. It's a soul link with another player, so our units are, like, interlinked. And Oh, interesting. Yeah, so it's obviously in a different context, but even on normal, game's hard. Like, yeah. it, it's, it's not a cakewalk at all. Um like normal mode fe10 is harder than hard mode fe9 in fact i'd say it's harder than maniac mode fe9 to be honest like <laughs> it, that game is just not difficult um <laughs> although i am saying that with the context that i understand what units are good um i remember yeah. not thinking fe9 was an easy game on my first playthrough when i was using rolf and mia and nefeni and <laughs> brom and all these <laughs> other guys who are just not effective <laughs> Um, but once you have a, I think, like, a baseline Fire Emblem understanding and you recognise, like, oh, this is what's good, and you use your units based on that, fe 9 is a very straightforward game. Do you think, like, that difficulty discrepancy, though, causes a, an issue with sequels from people who, like, might want to see the rest of the plot, but it's in a much harder game? Yeah, I think, like, obviously, like, if, if you're quote-unquote better at Fire Emblem, like, it's not going to be, like, I mean, it's not going to be, like, difficult mm -hmm. in terms of like the difficulty of playing the game it might be difficult in terms of like your patience playing the game there's not gonna be difficult playing like in like an easier one but like definitely there could be the reverse situation happening quite easily i think yeah although i will say the easy the the newer games do tend to have some very easy easier difficulties um and we've also got features like divine pulse dragon time crystals to help out in that regard which will probably alleviate a lot of that pressure i think in general the new games are incredibly accessible and that's only a good thing for the series like yes i agree they've done a really good job of making these games quite literally playable by anyone who just wants to experience the plot and in a lot of the games that's worked really well so where do you come down on this do you think fire emblem would benefit from more direct sequels uh i have to admit i'm really not sure i just i don't know i think it might be because of like what is the case with like the exit like i think that like it's interesting from like a world building perspective right mm -hmm. but i do think and like i do think that not all stories are going to be like oh yeah the plot's happened now everything is solved like in the case of fe10 where like obviously the effects of fe9 affecting dane and the way they do like leads to everything with the dawn brigade etc 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 right yeah. like that's not a world that's open and shut but like some games just very clearly just don't benefit from sequel like engage i don't know what if you do with the engage world like i mean they the struggled to, the game they struggled to find a dlc from that game for what i understand so um they... um e yeah i <laughs> yeah having played the dlc all i can say is yeah <laughs> um i'm not sure if you're more familiar with these games than i am but how does it work in like fe1 fe3 or like 
I guess just FE3 with book one and book two. Is uh, you... I haven't gone far enough through FE3 to be able to. Okay, yeah, I'm obviously doing my blind lunatic reverse playthrough of FE12 right now, so I haven't finished the game, so I can't really speak to how it how it applies there as well. But those are definitely direct sequels. Um, and so far, yeah. I'm enjoying what it's doing in FE12 with the plot of FE11 and FE1. <laughs> I think it's it's good. Um, I think most of the time this does end up being somewhat of a positive thing, as long as the games are designed around it. I think as long as it's planned in from yes. the start that... And also it has to be the right game for it. I don't care how much they planned around it for Engage, this game doesn't need a sequel. Like, it is it, not a sequel. Please, no sequel. This is not really a knock on Engage, but I don't need more of that world. I don't need more of Elios. Like, it's, I'm happy with the amount of Elios we've got. More gameplay similarities, absolutely fine, but I don't really need an expansion on that world. I don't think it's a world I care about enough for a sequel to it to be something I'm clamoring for. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, even outside of, like, that, in the case of Engage, right, like, the main conflict, like, literally comes from the existence of Sombron, like, as a result of all the countries eventually, like, banding together, like, and, like, just what's been... And like if you watch them, like what happens and like the support between like the crown royals, right? Mm -hmm. Like all of like basically all of the problems get solved. Like unironically, like all of the problems get solved. Like the problems between like Brodia and Elusia in terms of like their feud get solved because now the country doesn't worship the fell dragon. <laughs> yeah. Like you would kind of have to like Dragon Ball Z it in a way where like the big bad's been defeated, but there's another one conveniently on the way. Like it's yeah, like it's there, there's not, nothing like, left for these guys to fight. <laughs> like yeah, there, there's just there's nothing there. Like it's not a Fodland situation where like even like it's not a Fodland situation where like if we just pretend that one would be absolutely canon, which I'm not gonna say which one that would necessarily be, but like let's just imagine a hypothetical world that's completely canon. Mm -hmm. Like there's going to be fallout after it, no yeah. matter what happened, right? Yeah, for sure. So I think it does. Um, very, it's kind of weird in a way because like. The game I don't want the sequels for are the ones where the world isn't as fleshed out and could use more mm. fleshing out, but if you haven't done it in one game, I kind of don't I want don't a second the second to do one. it. Yeah. I don't like, think you're doing the second one. <laughs> yeah, like, it's it's definitely weird in that sense because like the worlds that are less explored, the worlds I want to know more about are the ones that I don't really want the sequel for in a way. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. But I think, by and large... I think I'm going to come down on agree on this one, as long as it's done properly. I'm not going to strongly agree because I don't, I'm not that bothered, really. Mm -hmm. um, I quite like the changing of settings and casts and all of that stuff as well. I think it's nice that we have so many different universes with which Fire Emblem contains. Fire Emblem engage moment. <laughs> true. Yeah, true. We have now tied them all together. Um, turns out Three Houses was a fictional book and everyone's just a ring. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, not gonna lie, this one I'm very neutral on, because, like, I... Like, I don't know, I think that, like, some Fire Emblem stories are, like, definitely, like, cool, and, like, I do enjoy, like, what some of them, like, bring in terms of storytelling and, like, character building or, like, world building, etc. Yeah. But, like, as someone who is ultimately here for, like, the gameplay and, like, I'm not gonna lie, like, if the gameplay is good and I enjoy it, like, I really don't care about the plot. Mm -hmm. Like, I I do find Conquest to be a bit on the side of, like, skill on the, oh my god, it's a pain, I have to check all of what all these enemies have in terms of skills or weaponry, etc. But, like, you know, if I enjoy the gameplay, like, I really just don't care about the plot. That's definitely um, fair. So, like, if a direct sequel would mean, like, much more, like, online discourse about, like, characters in a way that i find particularly insufferable i think i'll actually have to say i disagree with this one okay that's fair so you come down and disagree i personally would be fine with more direct sequels but that's i would like okay I, I i agree with you that like if the plot is like if like the game is designed in mind with, like this conflict like this one conflict that's the main focus of the first game has like ended but there's very clearly going to be like some knock-on effects that are quite significant yeah like i would be very all right with there being one um, but, like, I just, I don't know. I think that depending on the game, it could get quite messy, and I don't really trust intelligent systems to, uh, handle the plot of a sequel well, shall we say. <laughs> That's fair. From what I've seen so far, I think it's been done pretty well 
FE67 aside. <laughs> but I think that's <laughs> I think that's more just due to FE7's plot kind of being bad. Um, yes, it's certainly a plot that does exist, and things do happen there with some technical timeline, apparently. Yeah, like, and obviously, it's a, a a prequel is a very different thing to a sequel. It's it it does create a lot of issues in and of itself, but just <laughs> the the characters in FE Seven are not bought up, or the events of FE Seven are just not bought up, mentioned, or acknowledged in FE Six. Yeah, it, yeah, or like just. All the continuity errors, all the continuity errors. Yeah. But I think in general, as long as it's done well, yeah, I think Fire Emblem could benefit from more direct sequels. Yeah. No, I, I do ultimately agree with that part, that, like, it could benefit from it, mm -hmm. but I just don't necessarily think it would benefit from it. That's Because I'm, I'm really tired of, like, some of the uh, more character-based discourse that happens around Fire Emblem. Mm -hmm. So I I don't I don't need there to be like really messy implementations thereof. That's definitely fair. So that's wraps up our final take, I think. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And it's been a long one, but we've got some good discussion out. Hopefully, yes, I did enjoy it a lot. So hopefully <laughs> we said something semi coherent. <laughs> yeah, hopefully some of that makes some sort of sense in the edit. Um <laughs> But yeah, thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And a link to Akira's channel will be in the description below. So that wraps up this Agree to Disagree. Huge thanks once again to Akira for coming on. I would also like to once again thank everybody who backs the channel on Patreon. The support is greatly appreciated. And again, a link is in the description below if anybody else wants to support. If you want to discuss this video, the channel, or Fire Emblem in general, consider joining the Discord. And if you haven't already, ratings and comments are much appreciated. Thank you all very much for watching, and goodbye.